The Pied Piper of Hamelin by Robert Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter as the narrator Craig Franklin as the townspeople and the corporation Jason in Panama as the mayor Lian Yao as the Pied Piper And Sonia as the rat and the lame child the pied piper of hamelin hamelin towns in brunswick by famous hanover city the river weser deep and wide washes its wall on the southern side a pleasanter spot you never spied but when begins my ditty almost five hundred years ago to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was a pity rats they fought the dogs and killed the cats and bit the babies in the cradles and ate the cheeses out of the vats and licked the soup from the cook's own ladles split open the kegs of salted sprats made nests inside men's sunday hats and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats at last the people in a body to the town hall came flocking tis clear cried they our mayor is a noddy and as for our corporation shocking to think we buy gowns lined with ermine for dolts that can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin you hope because you're old and obese to find in the furry civic robes rouse up sirs give your brains a racking to find the remedy we're lacking or sure as fate we'll send you packing at this the mayor and corporation quaked with a mighty consternation an hour they sate in council at length the mayor broke silence for a gilder i'd my ermine gown sell i wish i were a mile hence it's easy to bid one rack one's brain i'm sure my poor head aches again i've scratched it so and all in vain oh for a trap a trap a trap just as he said this what should hap at the chamber door but a gentle tap bless us cried the mayor what's that with the corporation as he sat looking little though wondrous fat nor brighter was his eye, nor moister than a too long opened oyster, save when at noon his paunch grew mutinous for a plate of turtle, green and glutinous. Only a scraping of shoes on the mat, anything like the sound of a rat, makes my heart go pit to pat. Come in, the mayor cried, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure, his queer long coat from heel to head was half of yellow and half of red and he himself was tall and thin with sharp blue eyes each like a pin and light loose hair yet swarthy skin no tuft on cheek nor beard on chin but lips where smiles went out and in there was no guessing his kith and kin and nobody could enough admire the tall man and his quaint attire quoth one it says my great grandsire starting up at the trump of doom's tone had walked this way from his painted tombstone he advanced to the council table and please your honours said he i'm able by means of a secret charm to draw all creatures living beneath the sun that creep or swim or fly or run after me so as you never saw and i chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm the mole and toad and newt and viper and people call me the pied piper and here they noticed round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe to match with his coat of the selfsame check and at the scarf's end hung a pipe and his fingers they noticed were ever straying as if impatient to be playing upon this pipe as low it dangled over his vesture so old fangled yet said he poor piper as i am 
in tartary i freed the cham last june from his huge swarm of gnats i eased in asia the nizam of a monstrous brood of vampire bats and as for what your brain bewilders if i can rid your town of rats will you give me a thousand guilders one, one fifty thousand was the exclamation of the astonished mayor and corporation into the street the piper stepped smiling first a little smile as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while then like a musical adept to blow the pipe his lips he wrinkled and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled and ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered you heard as if an army muttered and the muttering grew to a grumbling and the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling and out of the houses the rats came tumbling great rats small rats lean rats brawny rats brown rats black rats gray rats tawny rats grave old plodders gay young friskers fathers mothers uncles cousins cocking tails and pricking whiskers families by tens and dozens brothers sisters husbands wives followed the piper for their lives from street to street he piped advancing and step for step they followed dancing until they came to the river Vaser, where an all plunged and perished save one who stout as julius caesar swam across and lived to carry as he the manuscript he cherished to ratland home his commentary which was at the first shrill notes of the pipe i heard a sound as of scraping tripe and putting apples wondrous ripe into a cider press's gripe and a moving away of pickled up boards and a leaving a jar of conserve cupboards and a drawing the corks of train oil flasks and a breaking the hoops of butter casks and it seemed as if a voice sweeter far than by harp or by psaltery is breathed called out rats rejoice the world is grown to one vast dry psaltery so munch on crunch on take your nuncheon breakfast supper dinner luncheon and just as a bulky sugar puncheon already staved like a great sun shone glorious scarce an inch before me just as methought it said come bore me i found the vaser rolling over me you should have heard the hamlin people ringing the bells till they rocked the steeple go cried the mayor and get long poles poke out the nests and block up the holes consult with carpenters and builders and leave in our town not even a trace of the rats when suddenly up the face of the piper perked in the market-place with a first of you please my thousand guilders a thousand guilders the mare looked blue so did the corporation too for council dinners made rare havoc with claret moselle vin de grave hock and half the money would replenish their cellar's biggest butt with rhenish to pay this sum to a wandering fellow with a gypsy coat of red and yellow beside quoth the mare with a knowing wink our business was done at the river's brink we saw with our eyes the vermin sink and what's dead can't come to life i think so friend we're not the folks to shrink from the duty of giving you something for drink and a matter of money to put in your poke but as for the guilders what we spoke of them as you very well know was in joke beside our losses have made us thrifty a thousand guilders come take fifty the piper's face fell and he cried no trifling i can't wait beside i've promised to visit by dinner-time baghdad 
and except the prime of the head cook's pottage, all he's rich in for having left in the caliph's kitchen of a nest of scorpions no survivor. With him, I proved no bargain driver. With you, don't think I'll bait a stiver. And folks who put me in a passion may find me pipe to another fashion. How? cried the mayor. Do you think I'll brook being worse treated than a cook? Insulted by a lazy ribald with idle pipe and vesture piebald? You threaten us, fellow? Do your worst. Blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe of smooth straight cane. And ere he blew three notes, such sweet soft notes as yet musicians cunning never gave the enraptured air there was a rustling that seemed like a bustling of merry crowds jostling at pitching and hustling small feet were pattering wooden shoes clattering little hands clapping and little tongues chattering and like fowls in a farmyard when barley is scattering out came the children running all the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flaxen curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping, ran merrily after the wonderful music with shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb, and the council stood as if they were changed into blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry to the children merrily skipping by, and could only follow with the eye that joyous crowd at the piper's back. But how the mare was on the rack, and the wretched council's bosoms beat, as the piper turned from the high street, to where the vaser rolled its waters, right in the way of their sons and daughters. However, he turned from south to west, and to Coppelberg Hill his steps addressed, and after him the children pressed, Great was the joy in every breast. He never can cross that mighty top. He's forced to let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. When lo, as they reached the mountain side, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollowed, and the piper advanced, and the children followed. And when all were in, to the very last, the door in the mountainside shut fast. Did I say all? No. One was lame, and could not dance the whole of the way. And in after years, if he would blame his sadness, he was used to say, It's dull in our town since my playmates left. I can't forget that I'm bereft of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me for he led us he said to a joyous land joining the town and just at hand where waters gushed and fruit trees grew and flowers put forth a fairer hue and everything was strange and new the sparrows were brighter than peacocks here and their dogs outran our fellow deer and honey-bees had lost their stings and horses were born with eagles wings and just as i became assured my lame foot would be speedily cured the music stopped and i stood still and found myself outside the hill left alone against my will to go now limping as before and never hear of that country more alas alas for hamlin there came into many a burgher's pate a text which says that heaven's gate opes to the rich at as easy rate as the needle's eye takes a camel in. The mayor sent east, west, north, and south to offer the piper by word of mouth, wherever it was men's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content. If he'd only return the way he went and bring the children behind him. But when they saw it, was a lost endeavor, and piper and dancers were gone forever. They made a decree that lawyers never should think their records dated duly if, after the day of the month and year, these words did not as well appear. 
and so long after what happened here on the twenty second of july thirteen hundred and seventy six and the better in memory to fix the place of the children's last retreat they called it the pied piper street where any one playing on pipe or tabor was sure for the future to lose his labor nor suffered they hostelry or tavern to shock with mirth a street so solemn but opposite the place of the cavern they wrote the story on a column and on the great church window painted the same to make the world acquainted how their children were stolen away and there it stands to this very day and i must not omit to say that in transylvania there is a tribe of alien people that ascribe the outlandish ways and dress on which their neighbors lay such stress to their fathers and mothers having risen out of some subterranean prison into which they were trepanned long time ago in a mighty band out of hamlin town in brunswick land but how or why they don't understand so willie let you and me be wipers of scores out with all men especially pipers and whether they pipe us free from rats or from mice if we've promised them aught let us keep our promise end of poem this recording is in the public domain quatrains by william hamilton hayne from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by lian yao quatrains moonlight song of the mockingbird each golden note of music greets the listening leaves divinely stirred as if the vanished soul of keats had found its new birth in a bird night mists sometimes when nature falls asleep around her woods and streams the mists of night serenely creep for they are nature's dreams an autumn breeze this gentle and half melancholy breeze is but a wandering hamlet of the trees who finds a tongue in every lingering leaf to voice some subtlety of sylvan grief end of poem this recording is in the public domain a yellow pansy by helen gray cohn from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by lian yao a yellow pansy to the wall of the old green garden a butterfly quivering came his wings on the sombre lichens played like a yellow flame he looked at the grey geraniums and the sleepy four o'clocks he looked at the low lanes bordered with a glossy growing box he longed over the peace and the silence and the shadows that lengthened there and his wild wee heart was weary of skimming the endless air and now in the old green garden i know not how it came a single pansy is blooming bright as a yellow flame and whenever a gay gust passes it quivers as if with pain for the butterfly soul within it longs for the winds again end of poem this recording is in the public domain Echo and Silence by Sir Samuel Egerton Bridges From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Echo and Silence In eddying course, when leaves began to fly, And autumn in her lap the store to strew, As mid wild scenes I chanced the muse to woo, through glens untrod and woods that frowned on high two sleeping nymphs with a wonder mute i spy and lo she's gone in robe of dark green hue 
twas echo from her sister silence flew for quick the hunter's horn resounded to the sky in shade affrighted silence melts away not so her sister hark for onward still with far heard step she takes her listening way bounding from rock to rock and hill to hill ah mark the merry maid and mockful play with thousand mimic tones a laughing forest fill end of poem this recording is in the public domain sherwood by alfred noyes from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by jason in panama sherwood sherwood in the twilight is robin hood awake gray and ghostly shadows are gliding through the break shadows of the dappled deer dreaming of the morn dreaming of a shadowy man that winds a shadowy horn robin hood is here again all his merry thieves hear a ghostly bugle note shivering through the leaves calling as he used to call faint and far away in sherwood in sherwood about the break of day merry merry england has kissed the lips of june all the wings of fairyland were here beneath the moon like a flight of rose leaves fluttering in a mist of opal and ruby and pearl and amethyst merry merry england is waking as of old with eyes of blither hazel and hair of brighter gold for robin hood is here again beneath the bursting spray in sherwood in sherwood about the break of day love is in the greenwood building him a house of wild rose and hawthorn and honeysuckle boughs love is in the greenwood dawn is in the skies and marion is waiting with a glory in her eyes hark the dazzled laverock climbs the golden steep marion is waiting is robin hood asleep round the fairy grass rings frolic elf and fay in sherwood in sherwood about the break of day oberon oberon rake away the gold rake away the red leaves roll away the mold rake away the gold leaves roll away the red and wake will scarlet from his leafy forest bed friar tuck and little john are riding down together with quarter staff and drinking can and gray goose feather the dead are coming back again the years are rolled away in sherwood in sherwood about the break of day softly over sherwood the south wind blows all the heart of england hidden in a rose hears across the greenwood the sunny whisper leap sherwood in the red dawn is robin hood asleep hark the voice of england wakes him as of old and shattering the silence with a cry of brighter gold a bugle in the greenwood echoes from the steep sherwood in the red dawn is robin hood asleep where the deer are gliding down the shadowy glen all across the glades of fern he calls his merry men doublets of the lincoln green dancing through the may in sherwood in sherwood about the break of day calls them and they answer from isles of oak and ash rings the follow follow and the boughs begin to crash the ferns begin to waver and the flowers begin to fly and through the crimson dawning the robber band goes by robin 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 all his merry thieves answer as the bugle note shivers through the leaves calling as he used to call faint and far away in sherwood in sherwood about the break of day alfred noyes end of poem this recording is in the public domain
far away by dr george sigerson from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by sonia far away as chimes that flow over shining seas when morn alights on meads of may faint voices fill the western breeze with whispering songs from far away oh dear the dells of dunamore a home is odorous ossery but sweet as honey running over the golden shore of far away there grows the tree whose summer breath perfumes with joy the azure air and he who feels it fears not death nor longer heeds the hounds of care o oh, soft the skies of seskinore and mild is meadowy mallaray but sweet as honey running over the golden shore of far away there sings the voice whose wondrous tune falls like diamond showers above that in the radiant day of june renew a world of youth and love o oh, fair the founts of farinfor and bright is billowy ballantray but sweet as honey running over the golden shore of far away come fragrance of the flowering tree o oh, sing sweet bird thy magic lay till all the world be young with me and love shall lead us far away o oh, dear the dells of dunamore a home is odorous ossery but sweet as honey running over the golden shore of far away end of poem this recording is in the public domain time the supreme from night thoughts night one by dr edward young from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox org by thomas peter time the supreme from night thoughts night one the bell strikes one we take no note of time but from its loss to give it then a tongue is wise in man as if an angel spoke i feel the solemn sound if heard aright it is the knell of my departed hours where are they with the years beyond the flood it is the signal that demands dispatch how much is to be done my hopes and fears start up alarmed and o'er life's narrow verge look down on what a fathomless abyss a dread eternity how surely mine and can eternity belong to me poor pensioner on the bounties of an hour time the supreme time is eternity pregnant with all eternity can give pregnant with all that makes archangels smile who murders time he crushes in the birth a power ethereal only not adored ah how unjust to nature and himself is thoughtless thankless inconsistent man like children babbling nonsense in their sports we censure nature for a span too short that span too short we tax as tedious too torture invention all expedients tire to lash the lingering moments into speed and whirl us happy riddance from ourselves art brainless art our furious charioteer for nature's voice unstifled would recall drives headlong towards the precipice of death death most our dread death thus more dreadful made oh what a riddle of absurdity leisure is pain takes off our chariot wheels how heavily we drag the load of life blessed leisure is our curse like that of cain it makes us wander wander earth around to fly that tyrant thought as atlas groaned the world beneath 
we groan beneath an hour. We cry for mercy to the next amusement. The next amusement mortgages our fields. Slight inconvenience. Prisons hardly frown from hateful time if prisons set us free. Yet when death kindly tenders us relief, we call him cruel. Years to moments shrink, ages to years. The telescope is turned. To man's false optics, from his folly false, time, in advance, behind him hides his wings, and seems to creep, decrepit with his age. Behold him when passed by. What then is seen but his broad pinions, swifter than the winds? And all mankind, in contradiction strong, rueful, aghast, cry out on his career. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tomorrow by Samuel Johnson from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by sonia tomorrow from irene tomorrow's action can that hoary wisdom borne down with years still dote upon tomorrow the fatal mistress of the young the lazy the coward and the fool condemned to lose an useless life in waiting for to-morrow to gaze with longing eyes upon to-morrow till interposing death destroys the prospect strange that this general fraud from day to day should fill the world with wretches undetected the soldier labouring through a winter's march still sees to-morrow dressed in robes of triumph still to the lover's long expecting arms to-morrow brings the visionary bride but thou too old to bear another cheat learn that the present hour alone is man's end of poem this recording is in the public domain three days by james roberts gilmore from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Three Days So much to do, so little done. Ah, yesternight I saw the sun sink beamless down the vaulted grey, the ghastly ghost of yesterday. So little done so much to do each morning breaks on conflicts new but eager brave i'll join the fray and fight the battle of to-day so much to do so little done but when it's o'er the victory won oh then my soul the strife and sorrow will end in that great glad to-morrow End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Procrastination From Night Thoughts, Night One By Dr. Edward Young From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yeah procrastination be wise today tis madness to defer next day the fatal precedent will plead thus on till wisdom is pushed out of life procrastination is the thief of time year after year it steals till all are fled and to the mercies of a moment leaves the vast concerns of an eternal scene if not so frequent would not this be strange that is so frequent, this is stranger still. Of man's miraculous mistakes this bears the palm, that all men are about to live, forever on the brink of being born. All pay themselves the compliment to think, they one day shall not drivel, 
and their pride in this reversion takes up ready praise at least their own their future selves applaud how excellent that life they now will lead time lodged in their own hands is folly's veils that lodged in fates to wisdom they consign the thing they can't but propose they postpone tis not in folly not to scorn a fall and scarce in a human wisdom to do more all promise is poor dilatory man and that through every stage when young indeed in full content we sometimes nobly rest unanxious for ourselves and only wish as duteous sons our fathers are more wise at thirty man suspects himself a fool knows it at forty and reforms his plan at fifty chides his infamous delay pushes his prudent purpose to resolve in all the magnanimity of thought resolves and re-resolves then dies the same and why because he thinks himself immortal all men think all men mortal but themselves themselves when some alarming shock of fate strikes through their wounded hearts a sudden dread but their hearts wounded like the wounded air soon close where past the shaft no trace is found as from the wing no scar the sky retains the parted wave no furrow from the keel so dies in human hearts the thought of death even with the tender arms which nature sheds o'er those we love we drop it in their grave end of poem this recording is in the public domain ave ad vale by rosamond marriott watson from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by sonia ave ad vale farewell my youth for now we needs must part for here the paths divide here hand from hand must sever heart from heart divergence deep and wide you'll wear no withered roses for my sake though i go mourning for you all day long finding no magic more in bower or brake no melody in song grey eld must travel in my company to seal this severance more fast and sure a joyless fellowship in faith twill be yet must we fare together i and he till i shall tread the footpath way no more but when a blackbird pipes among the boughs on some dim iridescent day in spring then i may dream you are remembering our ancient vows or when some joy foregone some fate forsworn looks through the dark eyes of the violet i may recross the set forbidden bourne i may forget our long long parting for a little while dream of the golden splendors of your smile dream you remember yet end of poem this recording is in the public domain the ballad of dead ladies by francois villon translated from the french by dante gabriel rossetti from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter the ballad of dead ladies tell me now in what hidden way is lady flora the lovely roman where's hipparchia and where is Thais? neither of them the fair woman where is echo beheld of no man only heard on river and mere she whose beauty was more than human but where are the snows of yesteryear where's eloise the learned nun for whose sake abbeyard i ween lost manhood and put priesthood on from love he won such dule and teen and where i pray you is the queen who will the buridan should steer sewed in a sack's mouth down the seine 
but where are the snows of yesteryear white queen blanche like a queen of lilies with a voice like any mermaiden bertha broadfoot beatrice alice and ermengarde the lady of mame and that good joan whom englishmen at ruin doomed and burned her there mother of god where are they then but where are the snows of yesteryear nay never ask this week fair lord where they are gone nor yet this year except with this for an overword but where are the snows of yesteryear end of poem this recording is in the public domain the approach of age sonnet 12 by william shakespeare from the world's best poetry volume 6 fancy and sentiment part 1 read for librivox.org by craig franklin the approach of age when i do count the clocks that tell the time and see the brave day sunk in hideous night when i behold the violet past prime and sable curls all silvered o'er with white when lofty trees i see barren of leaves which erst from heat did canopy the herd and summer's green all girded up in sheaves borne on the bier with white and bristly beard then of thy beauty do i question make that thou among the wastes of time must go since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake and die as fast as they see others grow and nothing gainst time's scythe can make defence save breed to brave him when he takes thee hence end of poem this recording is in the public domain the old year and the new by william cleaver wilkinson from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by jason in panama the old year and the new last night at twelve amid the knee-deep snows a child of time accepted his repose the eighteen hundred fifty sixth of grace with sudden chance fell forward on his face solemn and slow the winter sun had gone sailing full early for the port of dawn across broad zones of the ethereal sea with even rate he voyaged far and free while the cone shadow of the earth swept round the other half of heaven's embracing bound a weird and mystic dial hand to mark from orb to orb along the shuddering arc measured to music of the sphery chime the noiseless process of eternal time i walked in doubt and dread as if the weight of all the impending heaven upon me sate the crisp snow creaked my breath pushed stiffly out and keen frost sparkles merrily glanced about the clear cold stars reached down a frory ray like a fine icicle a crete of spray that prickled my blood with many a light attack of lilliput lances in my front and back for every several nerve alive to feel the eager season had some shrewd appeal and so the fields i gained and there i found the fresh dry snow laid by that querulous sound and all grew still as death within my breast hushing the noisy heartbeat on i pressed the punctual shadow to the summit drew twelve strokes of lighter silence fell like dew audible to the spirit and behold the vision of the dead year was unrolled full length he leaned aslant the slumbering snow which clad all things in chinese weeds of woe easing his fall that not a breath might mar the listening awe that yearned from snow to star but over him a spirit fair doth smile 
as fain all grief with gladness to beguile a torch he bears to light the world anew o blithe young year but keep thy promise true william cleaver wilkinson end of poem this recording is in the public domain the death of the old year by alfred lord tennyson from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter the death of the old year full knee deep lies the winter snow and the winter winds are wearily sighing told ye the church bell sad and slow and tread softly and speak low for the old year lies a dying old year you must not die you came to us so readily you lived with us so steadily old year you shall not die he lieth still he doth not move he will not see the dawn of day he hath no other life above he gave me a friend and a true true love and the new year will take him away old year you must not go so long as you have been with us such joy as you have seen with us old year you shall not go he frothed his bumpers to the brim a jollier year we shall not see but though his eyes are waxing dim and though his foes speak ill of him he was a friend to me old year you shall not die we did so laugh and cry with you i've half a mind to die with you old year if you must die he was full of joke and jest but all his merry quips are o'er to see him die across the waste his son and heir doth ride post haste but he'll be dead before every one for his own the night is starry and cold my friend and the new year blithe and bold my friend comes up to take his own how hard he breathes over the snow i heard just now the crowing cock the shadows flicker to and fro the cricket chirps the light burns low tis nearly twelve o'clock shake hands before you die old year we'll dearly rue for you what is it we can do for you speak out before you die his face is growing sharp and thin alack our friend is gone close up his eyes tie up his chin step from the corpse and let him in that standeth there alone and waiteth at the door there's a new foot on the floor my friend and a new face at the door my friend a new face at the door end of poem this recording is in the public domain. A Fancy from Fontenelle by Austin Dobson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama as the narrator And Lian Yao as the rose A Fancy from Fontenelle des mémoires de rose on n'a point vu mourir le jardinier the rose in the garden slipped her bud and she laughed in the pride of her youthful blood as she thought of the gardener standing by he is old so old and he soon must die the full rose waxed in the warm june air and she spread and spread till her heart lay bare and she laughed once more as she heard his tread he is older now he will soon be dead 
But the breeze of the morning blew and found that the leaves of the blown rose strewed the ground, and he came at noon, that gardener old, and he raked them gently under the mold. And I wove the thing to a random rhyme, for the rose is beauty, the gardener time. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. What is the grass? From The Song of Myself by Walt Whitman. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6. Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. What is the grass? From The Song of Myself. A child said, What is the grass? Fetching it to me with full hands. How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition, out of hopeful green stuff woven. Or I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift and remembrancer designedly dropped, bearing the owner's name some way in the corners, that we may see and remark and say, Whose? Or I guess the grass is itself a child, the produced babe of the vegetation. Or I guess it is the uniform hieroglyphic, and it means sprouting alike in broad zones and narrow zones, growing among black folks as among white, Kanak, Takaho, Congressman, Cuff. I give them the same. I receive them the same. Now it seems to me the beautiful uncut hair of graves. Tenderly will I use you, curling grass. It may be you transpire from the breasts of young men, and maybe if I had known them, I would have loved them. Maybe you are from old people, or from offspring taken soon out of their mother's laps, and here you are, the mother's laps. This grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers, darker than the colorless beards of old men, dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths. Oh, I perceive, after all, so many uttering tongues, and I perceive they do not come from the roofs of mouths for nothing. I wish I could translate the hints about the dead young men and women, and the hints about old men and mothers, and the offspring taken soon out of their laps. What do you think has become of the young and old men? And what do you think has become of the women and children? They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows there is really no death, and if ever there was, it led forward life, and does not wait at the end to arrest it, and ceased the moment life appeared. All goes onward and outward, nothing collapses, and to die is different from what anyone supposed, and luckier. Has anyone supposed it lucky to be born? I hasten to inform him or her, it is just as lucky to die, and I know it. My foothold is tenant and mortised and granite, I laugh at what you call dissolution, and I know the amplitude of time. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Petrified Fern by Mary L. Bowles Branch From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. The Petrified Fern In a valley, centuries ago, grew a little fern leaf, green and slender, veining delicate and fibres tender, waving when the wind crept down so low. Rushes tall and moss and grass grew round it, playful sunbeams darted in and found it, Drops of dew stole in by night and crowned it. But no foot of man e'er trod that way. Earth was young and keeping holiday. 
monster fishes swam the silent main stately forests waved their giant branches mountains hurled their snowy avalanches mammoth creatures stalked across the plain nature revelled in grand mysteries but the little fern was not of these did not number with the hills and trees only grew and waved its wild sweet way no one came to note it day by day earth one time put on a frolic mood heaved the rocks and changed the mighty motion of the deep strong currents of the ocean moved the plain and shook the haughty wood crushed the little fern in soft moist clay covered it and hid it safe away oh the long long centuries since that day oh the changes oh life's bitter cost since that useless little fern was lost useless lost there came a thoughtful man searching nature's secrets far and deep from a fissure in a rocky steep he withdrew a stone o'er which there ran fairy pencillings a quaint design veinings leafage fibres clear and fine and the fern's life lay in every line so i think god hides some souls away sweetly to surprise us the last day end of poem this recording is in the public domain the making of man by john white chadwick from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for LibriVox.org by jason in panama the making of man as the insect from the rock takes the color of its wing as the boulder from the shock of the ocean's rhythmic swing makes itself a perfect form learns a calmer front to raise as the shell enameled warm with the prism's mystic rays praises wind and wave that make all its chambers fair and strong as the mighty poets take grief and pain to build their song even so for every soul whatsoever its lot may be building as the heavens roll something large and strong and free things that hurt and things that mar shape the man for perfect praise shock and strain and ruin are friendlier than the smiling days john white chadwick end of poem this recording is in the public domain the ascent of man by rossiter w raymond from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by sonia as the narrator and jason and panama as the whisper the ascent of man he stood upon the earth and turned to gaze on sky and land and sea while in his ear the whisper burned behold these all belong to thee o wondrous call to conquests new o thrill of blood o joy of soul o peaks with ever widening view o race with still receding goal he heard he followed evermore stumbling and falling wandering far yet still advancing while before his footsteps shone the guiding star he cleft the seas the torrent loud he harnessed to his need or whim he bade the lightning of the cloud run with his words and toil for him he pierced the rock he scaled the steep destroyed created brought to light the secrets of the deepest deep the glories of the highest height the future and the past he scanned with sense refined and vision keen explored beyond this lower land the treasures of a realm unseen until he stood with regal brow no more as on the primal sod a creature yet ungrown but now lord of two worlds 
and child of god end of poem this recording is in the public domain Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam translated from Persian by Edward Fitzgerald from the world's best poetry volume 6 fancy and sentiment part 1 read for librivox.org by sonia thomas peter lian yao jason in panama and craig franklin rubaiyat wake for the sun who scattered into flight the stars before him from the field of night drives night along with them from heaven and strikes the sultan's turret with a shaft of light before the phantom of false morning died methought a voice within the tavern cried when all the temple is prepared within why nods the drowsy worshipper outside and as the cock crew those who stood before the tavern shouted open then the door you know how little while we have to stay and once departed may return no more now the new year reviving old desires the thoughtful soul to solitude retires where the white hand of moses on the bow puts out and jesus from the ground suspires iram indeed is gone with all his rose and yamshid's seven-ringed cup where no one knows but still a ruby kindles in the vine and many a garden by the water blows and david's lips are locked but in divine high piping pelevi with wine 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 red wine the nightingale cries to the rose that sallow cheek of hers din carnadine come fill the cup and in the fire of spring your winter garment of repentance fling the bird of time has but a little way to flutter and the bird is on the wing whether at naishapur or babylon whether the cup with sweet or bitter run the wine of life keeps oozing drop by drop the leaves of life keep falling one by one each morn a thousand roses brings you say yes but where leaves the rose of yesterday and this first summer month that brings the rose shall take yamshit and keikabat away well let it take them what have we to do with keikabat the great or keikhosru let zal and rostam bluster as they will or hatim call to supper heed not you with me along the strip of herbage strown that just divides the desert from the sown where name of slave and sultan is forgot and peace to mahmud on his golden throne a book of verses underneath the bough a jug of wine a loaf of bread and thou beside me singing in the wilderness o oh, wilderness were paradise enow some for the glories of this world and some sigh for the prophet's paradise to come ah take the cash and let the credit go nor heed the rumble of a distant drum look to the blowing rose about us lo laughing she says into the world i blow at once the silken tassel of my purse tear and its treasure on the garden throw and those who husbanded the golden grain and those who flung it to the winds like rain alike to no such aureate earth are turned as buried once men want dug up again the worldly hope men set their hearts upon turns ashes or it prospers and anon like snow upon the desert's dusty face lighting a little hour or two is gone think in this battered caravansary whose portals are alternate night and day how sultan after sultan with his pomp abode his destined hour and went his way they say the lion and the lizard keep the courts where yamshid gloried and drank deep and Baram, that great hunter the wild ass stamps o'er his head but cannot break his sleep i sometimes think 
that never blows so red the rose as where some buried caesar bled that every hyacinth the garden wears dropped in her lap from some once lovely head and this reviving herb whose tender green fledges the river lip on which we lean ah lean upon it lightly for who knows from what once lovely lip it springs unseen ah oh, my beloved fill the cup that clears to-day of past regrets and future fears to-morrow why to-morrow i may be myself with yesterday's seven thousand years for some we loved the loveliest and the best that from his vintage rolling time hath pressed have drunk their cup a round or two before and one by one crept silently to rest and we that now make merry in the room they left and summer dresses in new bloom ourselves must we beneath the couch of earth descend ourselves to make a couch for whom ah oh, make the most of what we yet may spend before we too into the dust descend dust into dust and under dust to lie sans wine sans song sans singer and sans end alike for those who for to-day repair and those that after some to-morrow stare amusing from the tower of darkness cries fools your reward is neither here nor there why all the saints and sages who discussed of the two worlds so wisely they are thrust like foolish prophets forth their words to scorn are scattered and their mouths are stopped with dust myself when young did eagerly frequent doctor and saint and heard great argument about it and about but evermore came out by the same door wherein i went with them the seed of wisdom did i sow and with mine own hand wrought to make it grow and this was all the harvest that i reaped i came like water and like wind i go into this universe and why not knowing nor whence like water willy-nilly flowing and out of it as a wind along the waste i know not whither willy-nilly blowing what without asking hither hurried whence and without asking whither hurried hence oh many a cup of this forbidden wine must drown the memory of that insolence up from earth's centre through the seventh gate i rose and on the throne of saturn sate and many a knot unravelled by the road but not the master knot of human fate there was the door to which i found no key there was the veil through which i might not see some little talk a while of me and thee there was and then no more of thee and me earth could not answer nor the seas that mourn in flowing purple of their lord forlorn nor rolling heaven with all his signs revealed and hidden by the sleeve of night and morn then of the thee in me who works behind the veil i lifted up my hands to find a lamp amid the darkness and i heard as from without the me within thee blind then to the lip of this poor earthen urn i leaned the secret of my life to learn and lip to lip it murmured while you live drink for once dead you never shall return i think the vessel with that fugitive articulation answered once did live and drink and ah the passive lip i kissed how many kisses might it take and give for i remember stopping by the way to watch a potter thumping his wet clay and with its all obliterated tongue it murmured gently brother gently pray and has not such a story from of old down man's successive generations rolled of such a clod of saturated earth cast by the maker into human mould and not a drop that from our cups we throw for earth to drink of 
but may steal below to quench the fire of anguish in some eye there hidden far beneath and long ago as then the tulip for her morning sup of heavenly vintage from the soil looks up do you devoutly do the like till heaven to earth invert you like an empty cup perplex no more with human or divine to-morrow's tangle to the winds resign and lose your lingers in the tresses of the cypress slender minister of wine and if the wine you drink the lip you press end in what all begins and ends in yes think then you are to-day what yesterday you were to-morrow you shall not be less so when that angel of the darker drink at last shall find you by the river brink and offering his cup invite your soul forth to your lips to quaff you shall not shrink why if the soul can fling the dust aside and naked on the air of heaven ride weren't not a shame weren't not a shame for him in this clay carcass crippled to abide tis but a tent where takes his one day's rest a sultan to the realm of death addressed the sultan rises and the dark farash strikes and prepares it for another guest and fear not lest existence closing your account and mine should know the like no more the eternal saki from that bowl has poured millions of bubbles like us and will pour when you and i behind the veil are past oh but the long long while the world shall last which of our coming and departure heeds as the sea's shelf should heed a pebble cast a moment's halt a momentary taste of being from the well amid the waste and lo the phantom caravan has reached the nothing it set out from oh make haste would you that spangle of existence spend about the secret quick about it friend a hair perhaps divides the false and true and upon what pretty may life depend a hair perhaps divides the false and true yes and a single alif were the clue could you but find it to the treasure house and peradventure to the master too whose secret presence through creation's veins running quicksilver like eludes your pains taking all shapes from ma to mahi and they change and perish all but he remains a moment guessed then back behind the fold immersed of darkness round the drama rolled which for the past time of eternity he doth himself contrive enact behold but if in vain down on the stubborn floor of earth and up to heaven's unopening door you gaze to-day while you are you how then to-morrow when you shall be you no more waste not your hour nor in the vain pursuit of this and that endeavour and dispute better be jocund with the fruitful grape than sadden after none or bitter fruit you know my friends with what a brave carouse i made a second marriage in my house divorced old barren reason from my bed and took the daughter of the vine to spouse for is and is not though with rule and line and up and down by logic i define of all that one should care to fathom i was never deep in anything but wine ah but my computations people say reduced the year to better reckoning nay twas only striking from the calendar unborn to-morrow and dead yesterday and lately by the tavern door agape came shining through the dusk an angel shape bearing a vessel on his shoulder and he bid me taste of it and twas the grape the grape that can with logic absolute the two and seventy jarring sects confute the sovereign alchemist that in a trice life's leaden metal into gold transmute the mighty mahmud allah breathing lord that all the misbelieving and black horde of fears and sorrows that infest the soul scatters before him with his whirlwind sword why be this juice the growth of god 
who dare blaspheme the twisted tendril as a snare a blessing we should use it should we not and if a curse why then who set it there i must abjure the balm of life i must scared by some after reckoning tain on trust or lured with hope of some diviner drink to fill the cup when crumbled into dust oh threats of hell and hopes of paradise one thing at least is certain this life flies one thing is certain and the rest is lies the flower that once has blown forever dies strange is it not that of the myriads who before us passed the door of darkness through not one returns to tell us of the road which to discover we must travel too the revelations of devout and learned who rose before us and as prophets burned are all but stories which awoke from sleep they told their comrades and to sleep returned i sent my soul through the invisible some letter of that afterlife to spell and by and by my soul returned to me and answered i myself am heaven and hell heaven but the vision of fulfilled desire and hell the shadow from a soul on fire cast on the darkness into which ourselves so late emerged from shall so soon expire we are no other than a moving row of magic shadow shapes that come and go round with the sun illumined lantern held in midnight by the master of the show but helpless pieces of the game he plays upon this checkerboard of nights and days hither and thither moves and checks and slays and one by one back in the closet lays the ball no question makes of eyes and nose but here or there as strikes the player goes and he that tossed you down into the field he knows about it all he knows he knows the moving finger writes and having writ moves on nor all your piety nor wit shall lure it back to counsel half a line nor all your tears wash out a word of it and that inverted bowl they call the sky where under crawling cooped we live and die lift not your hands to it for help for it as impotently moves as you or i with earth's first clay they did the last man need and there of the last harvest sowed the seed and the first morning of creation wrote what the last dawn of reckoning shall read yesterday this day's madness did prepare to-morrow silence triumph or despair drink for you know not whence you came nor why drink for you know not why you go nor where i tell you this when started from the goal over the flaming shoulders of the foal of heaven parween and mushtari they flung in my predestined plot of dust and soul the vine had struck a fibre which about it clings my being let the dervish flout of my base metal may be filed a key that shall unlock the door he howls without and this i know whether the one true light kindle to love or wrath consume me quite one flash of it within the tavern court better than in the temple lost outright what out of senseless nothing to provoke a conscious something to resent the yoke of unpermitted pleasure under pain of everlasting penalties if broke what from his helpless creature be repaid pure gold for what lie lent him dross allayed sue for a debt he never did contract and cannot answer oh the sorry trade o oh, thou who didst with pitfall and with gin beset the road i was to wander in 
thou wilt not with predestined evil round and gnash and then impute my fall to sin o thou who man of baser earth didst make and e'en with paradise devise the snake for all the sin wherewith the face of man is blackened man's forgiveness give and take as under cover of departing day slunk hunger stricken ramazan away once more within the potter's house alone i stood surrounded by the shapes of clay shapes of all sorts and sizes great and small that stood along the floor and by the wall and some loquacious vessels were and some listened perhaps but never talked at all said one among them surely not in vain my substance of the common earth was taken and to this figure moulded to be broke or trampled back to shapeless earth again then said a second ne'er a peevish boy would break the bowl from which he drank in joy and he that with his hand the vessel made will surely not in after wrath destroy after a momentary silence spake some vessel of a more ungainly make they sneer at me for leaning all awry what did the hand then of the potter shake whereat some one of the loquacious lot i think a sufi pipkin waxing hot all this of pot and potter tell me then who is the potter pray and who the pot why said another some there are who tell of one who threatens he will toss to hell the luckless pots he marred in making pish he's a good fellow and twill all be well well murmured one let whoso make or buy my clay with long oblivion is gone dry but fill me with the old familiar juice methinks i might recover by and by so while the vessels one by one were speaking the little moon looked in that all were seeking and then they jogged each other brother brother now for the porter's shoulder not a creaking ah with the grape my fading life provide and wash the body whence the life has died and lay me shrouded in the living leaf by some not unfrequented garden side that e'en my buried ashes such a snare of vintage shall fling up into the air as not a true believer passing by but shall be overtaken unaware indeed the idols i have loved so long have done my credit in this world much wrong have drowned my glory in a shallow cup and sold my reputation for a song indeed indeed repentance oft before i swore but was i sober when i swore and then and then came spring and rose in hand my threadbare penitence a pieces tore and much as wine has played the infidel and robbed me of my robe of honour well i wonder often what the vintners buy one half so precious as the stuff they sell yet ah that spring should vanish with the rose that youth's sweet-scented manuscript should close the nightingale that in the branches sang ah whence and whither flown again who knows would but the desert of the fountain yield one glimpse if dimly yet indeed revealed to which the fainting traveller might spring as springs the trampled herbage of the field would but some winged angel ere too late arrest the yet unfolded roll of fate and make the stern recorder otherwise in register or quite obliterate ah love could you and i with him conspire to grasp this sorry scheme of things entire would not we shatter it to bits and then remould it nearer to the heart's desire yon rising moon that looks for us again how oft hereafter will she wax and wane how oft hereafter rising look for us through this same garden and for one in vain and when like her o saki you shall pass amongst the guests star scattered on the grass and in your joyous errand reach the spot where i made one 
turn down an empty glass. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Time, an Enigma by Jonathan Swift. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Time, an Enigma. Ever eating, never cloying, all devouring, all destroying, never finding full repast till I eat the world at last. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This Life by William Drummond From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia This Life This life, which seems so fair, Is like a bubble blown up in the air By sporting children's breath who chase it everywhere and strive who can most motion it bequeath and though it sometimes seems of its own might like to an eye of gold to be fixed there and firm to hover in that empty height that only is because it is so light but in that pomp it doth not long appear for when tis most admired in a thought because it erst was naught it turns to naught End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Character of a Happy Life by Sir Henry Wotton From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama The Character of a Happy Life how happy is he born and taught that serveth not another's will whose armor is his honest thought and simple truth his utmost skill whose passions not his masters are whose soul is still prepared for death not tied unto the world with care of public fame or private breath who envies none that chance doth raise or vice who never understood how deepest wounds are given by praise nor rules of state but rules of good who hath his life from rumours freed whose conscience is his strong retreat whose state can neither flatterers feed nor ruin make accusers great who god doth late and early pray more of his grace than gifts to lend and entertains the harmless day with a well-chosen book or friend this man is freed from servile bands of hope to rise or fear to fall lord of himself though not of hands and having nothing yet hath all sir henry wotton end of poem this recording is in the public domain Retribution by Friedrich von Logau Translated from the German by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Retribution The mills of the gods grind late, but they grind fine. Greek Poet Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceeding small. Though with patience he stands waiting, with exactness grinds he all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lie by Sir Walter Raleigh From the World's Best Poetry Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Lie Go, soul, the body's guest, Upon a thankless errand, Fear not to touch the best, The truth shall be thy warrant, Go, 
since I needs must die and give the world the lie. Go tell the court it glows and shines like rotten wood. Go tell the church it shows what's good and doth no good. If church and court reply, then give them both the lie. Tell potentates they live, acting by others' actions, not loved unless they give, not strong but by their factions. If potentates reply, give potentates the lie. Tell men of high condition that rule the affairs of state, their purpose is ambition, their practice only hate. And if they once reply, then give them all the lie. Tell them that brave it most, they beg for more by spending, who in their greatest cost seek nothing but commending, and if they make reply, spare not to give the lie. Tell zeal it lacks devotion, tell love it is but lust, tell time it is but motion, tell flesh it is but dust, and wish them not reply, for thou must give the lie. Tell age it daily wasteth, tell honour how it alters, tell beauty how she blasteth, tell favour how she falters, and as they then reply, give each of them the lie. Tell wit how much it wrangles in tickle points of niceness, tell wisdom she entangles herself in over-wiseness, and if they do reply, straight give them both the lie. Tell physic of her boldness, tell skill it is pretension, tell charity of coldness, tell law it is contention, and as they yield reply, so give them still the lie. Tell fortune of her blindness, tell nature of decay, tell friendship of unkindness, tell justice of delay, and if they dare reply, then give them all the lie. Tell arts, they have no soundness, but vary by esteeming, tell schools, they want profoundness, and stand too much on seeming. If arts and schools reply, give arts and schools the lie. Tell faith, it's fled the city, tell how the country erreth, tell manhood shakes of pity, tell virtue least prefereth, and if they do reply, spare not to give the lie. So, when thou hast as I commanded thee, done blabbing, although to give the lie deserves no less than stabbing, yet stab at thee who will, no stab the soul can kill. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Generous Heir by Pallades, translated from the Greek by William M. Harding, from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. The Generous Heir breathing the thin breath through our nostrils we live and a little space the sunlight see even all that live each being an instrument to which the generous air its life has lent if with the hand one quench our draught of breath he sends the stark soul shuddering down to death we that are nothing on our pride are fed seeing but for a little air we are as dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Good Life, Long Life by Ben Jonson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Good Life, Long Life it is not growing like a tree in bulk doth make man better be or standing long an oak three hundred year to fall a log at last dry bald and sere a lily of a day is fairer far in may although it fall and die that night it was the plant and flower of light in small proportions we just beauty see and in short measures life may perfect be.
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Life by Richard Henry Wald From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yeh Life My life is like the summer rose That opens to the morning sky But ere the shades of evening close Is scattered on the ground to die Yet on the rose's humble bed the sweetest dews of night are shed, As if she wept the waste to see, But none shall weep a tear for me. My life is like the autumn leaf That trembles in the moon's pale ray, Its hold is frail, its date is brief, Restless, and soon to pass away. Yet, ere that leaf shall fall and fade, The parent tree will mourn its shade. The winds bewail the leafless tree, but none shall breathe a sigh for me. My life is like the prince which feet have left on Tampa's desert strand. Soon as the rising tide shall beat, all trace will vanish from the sand. Yet, as if grieving to efface all the siege of the human race, on that lone shore loud moans the sea. But none, alas, shall mourn for me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Where Lies the Land by Arthur Hugh Clough From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Where Lies the Land where lies the land to which the ship would go far far ahead is all her seamen know and where the land she travels from away far far behind is all that they can say on sunny noon upon the deck smooth face linked arm and arm how pleasant here to pace or o'er the stern reclining watch below the foaming wake far widening as we go on stormy nights when wild northwesters rave how proud a thing to fight with wind and wave the dripping sailor on the reeling mast exults to bear and scorns to wish it past where lies the land to which the ship would go far far ahead is all her seamen know and where the land she travels from away far far behind is all that they can say end of poem this recording is in the public domain life by george herbert from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by jason in panama life i made a posy while the day ran by here will i smell my remnant out and tie my life within this band but time did beckon to the flowers and they by noon most cunningly did steal away and withered in my hand my hand was next to them and then my heart i took without more thinking in good part time's gentle admonition who did so sweetly death's sad taste convey making my mind to smell my fatal day yet sugaring the suspicion farewell dear flowers sweetly your time ye spent fit while ye lived for smell or ornament 
and after death for cures. I follow straight without complaints or grief, since, if my scent be good, I care not if it be as short as yours. George Herbert End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Life by Ella Wheeler Wilcox From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator And Lian Yao as life Life Life, like a romping schoolboy full of glee, Doth bear us on his shoulders for a time. There is no pith too steep for him to climb, With strong lithe limbs, as agile and as free as some young roe he speeds by vale and sea by flowery mead by mountain peaks sublime and all the world seems motion set to rhyme till tired out he cries now carry me in vain we murmur come life says fair play and seizes on us god he goads us so he does not let us sit down all the day at each new step we feel the burden grow till our bent backs seem breaking as we go watching for death to meet us on the way end of poem this recording is in the public domain the rosebush by Johann Ludwig Uhland, translated from the German by William W. Caldwell, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. The Rosebush. A child sleeps under a rosebush fair. The buds swell out in the soft May air. Sweetly it rests and on dream wings flies to play with the angels in paradise and the years glide by a maiden stands by the rosebush fair the dewy blossoms perfume the air she presses her hand to her throbbing breast with love's first wonderful rapture blest and the years glide by a mother kneels by the rosebush fair soft sigh the leaves in the evening air sorrowing thoughts of the past arise and tears of anguish bedim her eyes and the years glide by naked and lone stands the rosebush fair world of the leaves in the autumn air withered and dead they fall to the ground and silently cover a new-made mound and the years glide by end of poem this recording is in the public domain. History of a Life by Brian Waller Proctor, also known as Barry Cornwall. From World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. History of a Life day dawned within a curtained room filled to faintness with perfume a lady lay at point of doom day closed a child had seen the light but for the lady fair and bright she rested in undreaming night spring rose the lady's grave was green and near it oftentimes was seen a gentle boy with thoughtful mien years fled he wore a manly face and struggled in the world's rough race and won at last a lofty place and then he died behold before ye humanity's poor sum and story life death and all that is of glory end of poem this recording is in the public domain my quaker grandmothers by oliver huckle from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment 
Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. My Quaker Grandmothers, like two little doves in grey on the boughs of a greenwood tree, my two Quaker grandmothers sit in my gay genealogy. The cavalier struts in my heart, the Puritan tugs at my will, but the Quaker faces say peace and passion and pride are still. Dear faces of infinite calm, ye have wrought a spell in my blood that maketh the world seem wise and sweet with the sunshine of God. Oliver Huckle End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Address to the Mummy at Belzoni's Exhibition by Horace Smith from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one read for librivox dot org by sonia address to the mummy at belzoni's exhibition and thou hast walked about how strange a story in thebes streets three thousand years ago when the memnonium was in all its glory and time had not begun to overthrow those temples palaces and piles stupendous of which the very ruins are tremendous speak for thou long enough hast acted dummy thou hast a tongue come let us hear its tune thou art standing on thy legs above ground mummy revisiting the glimpses of the moon not like thin ghosts or disembodied creatures but with thy bones and flesh and limbs and features tell us for doubtless thou canst recollect to whom should we assign the sphinx's fame was cheops or saphrenes architect of either pyramid that bears his name is pompey's pillar really a misnomer had thebes a hundred gates as sung by homer perhaps thou wert a mason and forbidden by oath to tell the secrets of thy trade then say what secret melody was hidden in memnon's statue which at sunrise played perhaps thou wert a priest if so my struggles are vain for priestcraft never owns its juggles perhaps that very hand now pinioned flat has hobnobbed with pharaoh glass to glass or dropped a happeny in homer's hat or doffed thine own to let queen dido pass or held by solomon's own invitation a torch at the great temple's dedication i need not ask thee if that hand when armed has any roman soldier mauled and knuckled for thou wert dead and buried and embalmed ere romulus and remus had been suckled antiquity appears to have begun long after thy primeval race was run thou couldst develop if that withered tongue might tell us what those sightless orbs have seen how the world looked when it was fresh and young and the great deluge still had left it green or was it then so old that history's pages contained no record of its early ages still silent incommunicative elf art sworn to secrecy then keep thy vows but prithee tell us something of thyself reveal the secrets of thy prison house since in the world of spirits thou hast slumbered what hast thou seen what strange adventures numbered since first thy form was in this box extended we have above ground seen some strange mutations the roman empire has begun and ended new worlds have risen we have lost old nations and countless kings have into dust been humbled while not a fragment of thy flesh has crumbled didst thou not hear the potter over thy head when the great persian conqueror cambyses marched armies over thy tomb with thundering tread overthrew osiris Horus, apis isis and shook the pyramids with fear and wonder when the gigantic memnon fell asunder if the tomb's secrets may not be confessed the nature of thy private life unfold 
a heart has throbbed beneath that leathern breast and tears adown that dusty cheek have rolled have children climbed those knees and kissed that face what was thy name and station age and race statue of flesh immortal of the dead imperishable type of evanescence posthumous man who quits thy narrow bed and standest undecayed within our presence thou wilt hear nothing till the judgment morning when the great trump shall thrill thee with its warning why should this worthless tegument endure if its undying guest be lost for ever oh let us keep the soul embalmed and pure in living virtue that when both must sever although corruption may our frame consume the immortal spirit in the skies may bloom End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. London Bridge by Frederick Edward Weatherly From the World's Best Poetry Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin London Bridge proud and lowly beggar and lord over the bridge they go rags and velvet fetter and sword poverty pomp and woe laughing weeping hurrying ever hour by hour they crowd along while below the mighty river sings them all a mocking song hurry along sorrow and song all is vanity neath the sun velvet and rags so the world wags until the river no more shall run dainty painted powdered and gay rolleth my lady by rags and tatters over the way carries a heart as high flowers and dreams from country meadows dust and din through city skies old men creeping with their shadows children with their sunny eyes hurry along sorrow and song all is vanity neath the sun velvet and rags so the world wags until the river no more shall run storm and sunshine peace and strife over the bridge they go floating on in the tide of life whither no man shall know who will miss them there to-morrow waste that drift to the shade or sun gone away with their songs and sorrow only the river still flows on hurry along sorrow and song all is vanity neath the sun velvet and rags so the world wags until the river no more shall run end of poem this recording is in the public domain the crowded street by william cullen bryant from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part one Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Crowded Street Let me move slowly through the street, Filled with an ever-shifting train, Amid the sound of steps that beat The murmuring walks like autumn rain. How fast the flitting figures come, The mild, the fierce, the stony face, Some bright with thoughtless smiles, And some where secret tears have left their trace they pass to toil to strife to rest to halls in which the feast is spread to chambers where the funeral guest in silence sits beside the dead and some to happy homes repair where children pressing cheek to cheek with mute caresses shall declare the tenderness they cannot speak and some who walk in calmness here shall shudder as they reach the door where one who made their dwelling dear its flower its light is seen no more youth with pale cheek and slender frame and dreams of greatness in thine eye goes thou to build an early name or early in the task to die keen son of trade with eager brow who is now fluttering in thy snare thy golden fortunes tower they now or melt the glittering spires in air 
who of this crowd to-night shall tread the dance till daylight gleam again who sorrow over the untimely dead who writhe in throes of mortal pain some famine struck shall think how long the cold dark hours how slow the light and some who flaunt amid the throng shall hide in dens of shame to-night each where his tasks or pleasures call they pass and heed each other not there is who heeds who holds them all in his large love and boundless thought these struggling tides of life that seem in wayward aimless course to tend are eddies of the mighty stream that rolls to its appointed end end of poem this recording is in the public domain